how do you approach your stage performance, your your shows? Because they just seem to be so engaging and fun. And I just love to hear how you think about it because they seem very creative. Sure. Well, first off, thanks. Um, second off, I am a natural performer, but my stage thing I have had to really shed. I have been doing this for a long time and I've been studying performance, you know, uh, kind of independently throughout my life and studying what it means to watch something that enter that's entertaining and try to try to figure out why something has me captivated if I'm captivated. Why does a certain song elicit a a visceral response from me that just makes me want to do this or makes me want to cry or makes me want to reflect? So I'm I'm always curious about like when I'm when I'm having an emotional response to something what are some of the objective things that are making me have that feeling? And then, of course, there's magic and there's the spiritual realm of things that like you're just your life experiences and the experience and the uh, the authenticity of whatever is being presented to you has so much to do with it. There's 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 that thing. But there are certain objective things that I've tried to pay attention to. And for myself, it's been a journey because like I was doing a, a punk rock thing for a while. I was, you know, as a kid, that's kind of how I got started playing music. And then I went to school, was doing more of the jazz thing. And a lot of the jazz performers that I would go see at the clubs around my house or, or around the Twin Cities area, Minneapolis, St. Paul, it wasn't, it was all about what I'm playing or what they're playing as a soloist and what they're doing and what they're saying through their music. And it, there was not really any regard to the audience other than that. Mm -hmm. And that was fun as somebody who's studying that art form and that craft. But I also found myself after an hour and a half of that feeling like, like you're saying, like I wanted another layer to that thing. And I knew that myself, um, I went to see one of my absolute favorite guitar players in the world. I'm not going to say his name legend of a jazz guitarist <laughs> hero of mine he put on a three-hour concert and at the i don't know 110 minute marker i was thinking to myself i want nothing more than for this to be the last song this please god mm -hmm. please let this be the last song i've had so much and there i am sitting next to my wife and I know that if this is my favorite artist, <laughs> I'm a guitar player. I am studying everything he's doing. I'm absorbing everything it is. I'm absorbing it from around, like, the as the band, the interaction, all the thing. And I'm looking around, and I'm seeing other people also feeling really antsy. And it was just, like, so much being thrown at me. And my wife's like, yeah, I was, I was out after about 90 minutes. And I lasted 110, 115 minutes. And then we we struggled through about 70 more minutes of music, you know, and, and not not struggle. It was still enjoyable, but mm -hmm. it was like, oh, my gosh, please. I just want this. There's just too much. There's there's nothing other than the music to keep me captivated in the thing. And even though it's my favorite artist, I was just bored by the time it hit the two hour mark. So for that, I, I was thinking like, OK, what are some of the things that they could have done that would have kept me captivated and. Sure, there are certain jazz traditions that you're you're going for a certain thing. You're shooting for a certain target, and not just jazz either. Sometimes in the classical world, or or, or other uh, forms of art that forms of music that that aren't necessarily like hey, you mm -hmm. know. And and of course, there's a fine line of that. If you get too Vegas show bandy, it's like all right, I get it, I get it, and. You know, with Kaz, his sh his show toes that line a little bit because there is so much shtick, mm -hmm. but there's musical shtick that really works. And there's just stuff that's like, when you do this thing, it's always going to work. I don't know why. When Wolfpack goes out and we leave the stage and Joe Dart just shreds the bass, it's going to work every time because Joe is Joe and because he's going to wow the audience with a thing. But it's also an intentional moment to give a breath or a, a different thing from what's happening. For me, when I go out and when I'm doing my shows, I try to bring in elements of 
musical humor because I know from my Facebook analytics that 80%, 70 to 80% of my audience is creatives or many of them musicians themselves if they're not photographers, videographers, mm-hmm. whatever. You know, So I know certain types of humor that will connect with my audience. I know certain types of references and pop culture references that the majority of my audience knows because I, I know a lot about them because I care to know about them. So I don't know. I think my journey has been to find some way to connect with the audience beyond just the music, especially the, the, a lot of this just goes as an instrumental artist. If you're singing songs, you're in a completely different game. For me, the majority of my show is instrumental. So I get sick of hearing the guitar for two hours and I'm a guitar player, I'm guessing a lot of the general public, general population will as well, even if they're musicians. So I like to pass the attention around. I like to pass the energy around. And then also, it's just like, do is what is my guiding light in what I'm doing? It's joy. I want to bring joy to people, and I want to be able to project that from myself so that way... The music that I'm playing is just a reflection of that. And when I'm performing, if that's what I want to put out, that's what I need to be you know, aware of as far as my body language and how I'm performing, how I'm presenting things. So I don't know. This is a long-winded answer of saying my awareness of audience and just awareness of vision is, is a big part of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, there's a lot I want to get into even just from what you had said there, because I think especially jazz musicians, like you were talking about, have this idea that it's so much all about the music that it's like almost like forbidden to think about what the audience is thinking about it. And they think of people like Miles Davis that, you know, turn away from the audience or anything like that. It's, it's like, could be to that level. Um, but I think what you're kind of getting at is thinking about the audience is, sort of your way of connecting to them and, and providing that joy. Um, who would be some of those performers that some musicians could check out to sort of shed their uh, performance? And doesn't necessarily have to be in, it could be in any musical genre that you uh, check out. Yeah. Uh, let me think about that while I'm thinking about mm-hmm. that. I, I, yeah, that's a classic example. The miles thing, turning his back on the audience. People are like, well, I don't need to entertain because miles, mm-hmm. you know, he would turn his back. I was like, Hate to tell you, bro, but you are not Miles <laughs> yeah, Davis, right? and you haven't been, you know, you did, yeah. you weren't like the pioneer of several subgenres of jazz, and you weren't the pioneer of several musical moments and uh-huh. like modal music in general. <laughs> like you, you don't get that authority unless you are him, yeah. or you know, maybe you do, or you get you grant yourself that. But yeah, most of us have to be more aware or more intentional about that Mm -hmm. and i guess that's what my my answer would be is watching artists that are very intentional about their show i've been a part of pop tours where we play basically the same show night after night Mm -hmm. same set list to a click track and you go and you find some way as a musician to to insert all of your emotion that's that the intention of that song is the intention of my guitar part and how it contributes to that song, how that song contributes to the whole of the show, how that show is a part of this artist's vision. And when you understand that stuff, it allows you to to open yourself to the intentionality of, of what a pop artist or what any performer is trying to get across with, with what they're doing. So I think for a lot of people, just like you wouldn't think so, but look at the way that Taylor Swift or Katy Perry builds their shows. Look at the way that Beyonce builds her sets and her shows and that sort of thing. Or then take a look at uh, some of the artists that do that sort of thing, but it's not just about the star. Like, Take a look at the way that Earth, Wind & Fire puts on their shows, or Michael Jackson, or Prince. Like Prince, to Mm -hmm. me, is the biggest example because he's singing, he's dancing, he's playing the guitar, and he's crushing literally all of them. He's intentionally going to certain parts of the stage to entertain certain sides of the stadium or arena mm-hmm. because he knows that that experience matters for those people. And the the artists that really understand how they connect with the audience are going to recognize it's not just 
going up to this side because then all the people over there are going to feel, you know, alienated or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's really watching the artists that have no choice but to really telegraph big motions. Like if you look at, at artists that are playing on those big stages, they've got to really telegraph big movements of of where they're going because it's it's being telegraphed to such a large audience, especially before it was expected that there was like IMAG and all that stuff. Um, you know, like, I don't know. So uh, you watch Maroon 5 perform and, you know, James Valentine is running all around and he's, he's going to different areas of the catwalk and he's got his moments mm -hmm. and you go see, I don't know, Prince, Prince to me is the best example, but then also you find artists that are doing the music thing that are just naturally really fun and entertaining to watch like John Batiste. Uh, he is so fun. He's so entertaining and he's so genuine in what he's doing. There's no doubting the musical integrity of anything mm -hmm. that he's doing but he's just such a showman as well. He understands show business. Looking at Sammy Davis Jr., looking at uh, you know old Sinatra, any of those cats in the Rat Pack, they were well aware of the entertainment side of things. Sammy Davis Jr. especially. This, I've seen so many insane, insane videos. Like where he's on drums just, uh, or then vibes or then like dancing and singing all the – yeah. Yes, and then when he's then there's a part of the show where he brings the cat out to play bongos, and it's like this dude does these mind bending bongo things, and he's just singing along, and it's like, oh my gosh, that is so much entertainment. And you know, if you think about the intentionality of that, you got this huge band playing a huge show, and then all of a sudden there's this moment where it's more intimate. It's these two guys doing this thing, and there's so much action and there's so much energy. But it's in the it's within the context of something that feels more intimate, you know. So finding some of those things, what's the energy of something, but then also what's the overall feel? Trying to pay attention to those things, like you know, you see that in a lot of Prince recordings and performances that he did. To me, it almost seems like dynamic of the show in the same way that you might have dynamics in a song or across your set. You're talking about totally. like differences in like the con like a contrast between a bit a, a large group and then a smaller group or then uh maybe different textures or different instrumentation like like you were saying the the maceo park or the sax drums and that creates more interest and is entertaining for an audience that's like they don't have the same context that you do as a musician like you know everything those guys in your band have played as a band and what they're going for and all that the audience is like maybe it's their first time seeing you and you have to somehow communicate to them the feeling that you want and you have to communicate to them that you care. Yeah. You know, like for a lot of people, well, for cause, for instance, he's playing, he could play much bigger venues for a smaller ticket price. He sells mm -hmm. out a lot of shows. Like every show that I've seen of him around this area, the shows have been sold out. He could have played a bigger venue, but they're higher ticket prices. So when people pay higher ticket prices, there's also a certain expectation attached to that. It's like, if I paid 60 bucks to see this artist play, I really hope, I really hope that they show me that they care. Because 60 bucks is a lot of money to do mm -hmm. something, you know? Especially if it's like, you know, you go with a friend or you, you take your significant other and you paid 10 bucks for parking, you you got a drink, mm -hmm. you got a a snack, whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's an expensive night. So if you're aware of that, then there's there's a certain level of respect that you need to give to the audience and yeah i think i think that's that's part of it and and like you're saying night after night like what is every when when you're sitting down to write a song what does everybody want everybody in the world want when they write that song they want it to be a hit mm -hmm. right what ha what's going to happen if you get a hit a huge hit song you're going to have to play it every night like what did you think was going to happen if you write a great song and people want to hear it? So you have to find some way to connect with that uh, in a way that's that that makes it feel like like it really matters. I am going to say something that's going to sound like uh, a flex, but it is not a flex at all. It is because I was interviewing him yesterday. Yesterday I was talking to Kevin Bacon, the actor, and 
he was talking about sometimes we were talking because he also plays music and I was asking him about well like you know sometimes we have to go on the road and play songs over and over again. he's like dude sometimes I have to do a scene a hundred times from a because so the cameras can get a hundred angles for this one scene in a movie I we do it a hundred times in one day and when I say pass the salt pass the salt I have to think about I have to think about the fact that I want salt and that the salt is going to make my food taste better. Mm -hmm. And every time I do it, I have to think about that. I was thinking how just how getting beyond just the performance of past the salt is. And for us as musicians to be able to say, this is what I meant when I wrote this song. This is why I wrote it. This is the feeling that I had in that moment. And this is the feeling that I want the listener, the audience to have. This is how I want them to connect with it. If you dig deep within that every single night, sometimes it's just like, boom, I'm playing a G chord. But I chose that voicing because it had a certain effect for the verse. And when mm -hmm. I tighten up and play more rhythmic on on the sec on the pre-chorus, it's because it has a certain emotional or or rhythmic momentum to it that drives the message of the song. So if I can think more about that, it allows my performance night after night to mean a lot more. 